So I want to talk to you today about the need for systems level change in the 21st century and the challenges and opportunities that this creates for design and designers. I also want to introduce you to transition design, a new area of design study, research, and practice that is being quickly taken up by design educators and practitioners around the world. So we developed transition design in response to the step changes that we've seen in the field just in the past 10 years. Designers are working in areas that we never thought possible when I was young. And the tools and approaches of design are being taken up within countless other fields and disciplines to aid in complex problem solving and collaboration. Right now, it really does feel like the sky is the limit for design and designers. And for those of you at the beginning of your career, I think you can go practically anywhere. The increasing demand for design has to do with its integrative character. So design can be situated between the two disciplinary poles of science and the humanities to form a kind of third culture. Science observes the facts of our material world and the humanities interpret the qualities of human experience. Design synthesizes these two approaches and is concerned with the best of human intention within the constraints or facts of reality. When designers get it right, we not only design things people want, but we also ask if they should be designed at all. So the Winterhouse Social Design Pathways Matrix was developed about three and a half years ago by a group of design educators that was convened by the late, great Bill Drintel. I was one of the authors of this tool and our aim was to map the territories and scales at which designers now work. So as you move from the lower left to the upper right, this, the range of expertise increases as does the scale of engagement. So in the lower left, a designer is usually working alone or in a small design team to develop physical artifacts or communications. Design educators sometimes refer to this as posters and toasters. In the upper right corner is where designers work on projects that transform economies, cultures, or even societies. Designers are members of transdisciplinary teams who work on game-changing projects and initiatives like policy design. Here, designers are not the experts. Instead, they are co-designing, collaborating, and perhaps facilitating among experts from other disciplines. So we can run a topic area through the matrix to better explain how it works. Take the complex problem of childhood obesity. In this matrix, you see how the different scales of engagement and expertise lead to very different types of solutions. A solution in the lower left might involve the design of a cafeteria tray that limits food portions, while in the upper right, it might be the design and implementation of regional or even national uh, food policies. Here is the point. In order to seed, catalyze, and direct systems level change, solutions need to be designed and connected within every square in that matrix. However, the kind of design that occurs in the upper levels of this matrix requires new knowledge and skill sets that will come from outside the design disciplines. You've all heard the metaphor of the T-shaped person. The vertical stroke rec represents the depth of disciplinary expertise, and the horizontal stroke the breadth of knowledge required for productive collaboration and complex problem solving. Now the diagram on the right shows where most traditional design curricula were or even are conceived. And those of us over the age of 45 in the room probably learned to design there. So when we're doing things like letter spacing, we are at the very bottom of that T. But it's difficult, if not impossible, to collaborate with folks from other disciplines when we are head down, butt up in the depths of our own discipline. Our vocabularies, disciplinary norms, ways of framing and solving problems are very, very different. It's a bit like the proverbial Tower of Babel. No one understands each other and everyone thinks they're right. Systems level design that impacts 
cultures, societies, and economies require skills that reside higher in the disciplinary silo and demand a greater breadth of knowledge. This is the move from disciplinary expert to collaborator, co-designer, facilitator, or even beginner who asks well-timed, stupid questions of the experts. But here too is where designers are teachers, offering the tools and approaches of design to folks from other disciplines. Here is where design truly becomes an integrative discipline. So the most valuable designers in the 21st century will be the ones that are able to move fluidly up and down the disciplinary silo and side to side with knowledge gained outside the design disciplines. Traditionally, this ability has come only after spending years, if not decades, in practice. So at CMU, we are trying to integrate these skills into programs and curricula to produce a new generation of designer that works this way from the outset. Now here is where transition design comes in. We think the missing axis on this matrix is the element of time, big time, decades, hundreds of years kind of time. So our Native American ancestors thought in terms of seven generations out in the future, and our modern societies have pretty much lost that ability. We think designing for societal transitions should become an area of design focus with distinct knowledge and skill sets. It's designed for systems level change that can only be practiced for and over long horizons of time. It is designed for big problems with large consequences. And it's a bit like planting a tree whose shade you might not live to enjoy. But first I wanna situate transition design in relation to two other important areas of design focus. Along a continuum in which the scale of time, depth of engagement, and size of context expands to include both social and environmental concerns. Service design is now a well-established area of design focus, usually practiced within the for-profit economic paradigm, which over the long haul is inherently unsustainable. Sur not service design or economic paradigm. Design for social innovation is a relatively new and developing discipline that begins to challenge dominant socioeconomic paradigms by leveraging unused social resources and proposing alternative economic models. Transition design calls for new and radically different socioeconomic paradigms based upon the reconception of entire lifestyles. These lifestyles will be local and place-based, but cosmopolitan in their regional and global exchange of information and technology, cosmopolitan localism. Transition design argues that societal transitions toward more sustainable futures are design problems, and that design and designers have a key role to play in these transitions. So transition design brings together two global memes. The idea that entire societies must transition to more sustainable futures, and the realization that such transitions will require intentional systems level change. Now, you can see evidence of these memes in the number of transition-related projects and initiatives springing up literally all over the world, and the recent rise in what I'll call deep systems thinking, and the proliferation of knowledge, tools, and processes for understanding complex systems. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on how systems work, and very briefly on how socio-technical systems transition over long horizons of time. Systems are everywhere, and their ubiquity is perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other, and one says to the other, how's the water? And the other replies, what water? Marshall McLuhan, in his book, War and Peace in the Global Village, said one thing fish know nothing about is water since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. Systems are so ubiquitous and our interactions with them so pervasive, we don't see them and therefore we don't understand them very well. 
And let me be clear, I'm not talking about the systems that we graphic designers create to unify elements, quite the opposite. Within this context, a system is essentially a set of things like people, cells, molecules, communities, and communities of these things. And they are all interconnected through webs of relationship, and here's the rub, produce their own patterns of behavior over time. Transition design is concerned with three kinds of systems. Living systems, designed or mechanical systems, and socio-technical systems, which are a combination of the first two. This is perhaps a better representation of that relationship. Living systems are the ones we need to study and understand because they should be the model for how we live and design. Living systems are complex and open, meaning they are in a constant exchange of energy and matter with their environment. They are cooperative and couple with each other in symbiotic ways. They are full of diversity and redundancy, and they are always evolving and changing. And this disequilibrium gives rise to new, creative, resilient, and adaptive forms of behavior. And living systems in their natural state are sustainable. Now we ourselves are living systems. Our families, our communities of interest, like this conference, nations, religions. Living systems display, display emergent behavior. They can be perturbed by their external environment, but their response to that perturbation is entirely self-directed. Chaos and complexity scientists often explain it this way. Kick a dog you're unfamiliar with and try to accurately predict his response. I've been studying living systems for over 15 years now, and I'm convinced that they have great relevance for design. Understanding these principles, many of which can seem counterintuitive, is essential to designing for systems level change and societal transition. Now the second type of systems are the ones human, humans make. They are often referred to as mechanical or closed systems. These systems are brittle because they are simple, linear, centralized, and efficient. All redundancy has been designed out. They are inflexible and non-adaptive, meaning they don't change, evolve, and couple with each other or the environment in symbiotic ways. Living and mechanical systems couple and co-evolve with each other in highly complex ways, and that gives rise to the third kind of system. Socio-technical systems are tangles of living and designed or mechanistic systems in which technology plays an ever-increasing role. They are bound up in complex webs of relationship, interactions, and physical infrastructure that become ever more dense over time. However, unlike living systems, the interactions and relationships in socio-technical systems are not necessarily symbiotic or cooperative. In fact, they are increasingly in dissonance with each other and the natural world. And this dissonance gives rise to what we designers call wicked problems. So let's dig a bit deeper into the complexities of socio-technical systems. This is actually a visualization of the global air transportation system. But this system is dependent upon and connected to myriad other transport-related systems and subsystems. For example, the extensive local, regional, and continental system of roadways and highways that connect society at multiple levels of scale. This system, of course, is connected to countless other subsystems that include traffic lights, highway signs, speeding cameras, parking meters, parking garages, gas stations, and on and on. This is the water we swim in and no longer see. And of course, design is found everywhere within these socio-technical systems. And we and these systems both need to transition towards sustainability. I presented a paper on transition design at a socio-technical transition conference about a year ago and produced this diagram to demonstrate design's ubiquity. Now, weirdly, prior to this, transition scholars, and there's a whole bunch of them out there, were relatively unaware of either design or designers. 
So design, it seems, is also the water we all swim in, but so, unfortunately, are wicked problems. The dissonance within socio-technical systems gives rise to countless wicked problems like these, to name but a few. And wicked problems are systems problems. They are interconnected, interdependent, and exist at multiple levels of scale. Now, learning to see these problems, map their interconnections in order to understand and get at their root causes will be a skill set of the transition designer. Solving for these problems and nudging our socio-technical systems into more sustainable trajectories is the primary challenge for design in the 21st century, I would say. Now, socio-technical systems are continually transitioning, but these transitions have been unintentional and full of drift. And we've only understood the long arcs of these transitions in hindsight. However, there is an emerging branch of research and scholarship in Northern Europe that actually studies how these transitions happen over time. And their premise is this. If we better understand how societal transitions happen, then perhaps we can intentionally seed, catalyze, and direct them along into more sustainable trajectories. One of their most widely researched transitions is from the horse-drawn carriage to the automobile. And this milestone paper by F.W. Heels looks at how small and large changes within a socio-technical system led to a transition that essentially resulted in a world dominated by cars and highways and an oil-based global economy. I did not design this chart, by the way. Socio-technical researchers have identified three key systems levels, the landscape, the regime, and the niche. And they argue that systems transition is the result of small and large-scale events, technical innovations and breakthroughs, and changes in social norms and practices in everyday life. These all take place against a backdrop of slow-moving events such as climate change, natural disasters, population growth, etc. Now, understanding these systems dynamics can inform both small and large design interventions that can shift a socio-technical system over time. Here we see how a technological innovation at the large, slow-moving level of the landscape, electricity, gave rise to an in innovation that originated in the protected niche level, the electric tram. The success of this innovation eventually changed infrastructure at the regime level. Are you with me still? Streets as transport arteries grew exponentially. The important thing to emphasize is this. Systems level change involves design in all areas of the matrix. From the lower left to the upper right, you can design a logo as part of a systems transition strategy, but only if you have an understanding of the larger context, the whole system and its dynamics. Now remember that design permeates socio-technical systems, which means that small projects like logos or products, as well as system solutions like policy design, all come into play when shifting a system. The trick is knowing where and how to intervene, as systems theorist Danella Meadows has famously noted. In a way, what these researchers have done is been mapping acupuncture meridians for socio-technical systems. Transition design argues that systems can be intentionally transitioned via strategic interventions at multiple levels of scale if they are connected to mid and long-term visions of sustainable futures. Transition designers design an intervention, wait and see how the system responds, then they intervene again, perhaps at a different level. Many, many times, over many, many years, in concert with many other projects and initiatives, this will take special knowledge and skill sets. Transition designers will apply a deep understanding of systems anatomy and dynamics. They will think, see, and design fluidly between systems levels. 
They will think in long horizons of time and study historical transitions in order to design for near and distant futures. They will be patient, speculative, and dare we say it, humble. They will be radical collaborators and know when to follow, when to lead, when to facilitate, and when to ask well-timed stupid questions. They will be transdisciplinary lifelong learners and grumpy optimists. So the question we are asking is whether it's possible to intentionally seed and catalyze a new area of design that focuses on systems level change and contributes to sustainable transitions. It took 27 years for service design to evolve from a conversation in academia to an international network of practitioners. And it has taken 12 years for the Transition Town movement to go from an energy descent project in a classroom in Ireland to a global movement of over 1,100 communities in 43 countries. It's been five years since the term transition design was first proposed in a doctoral thesis and three years since it was integrated into our programs and curricula. Now we are actively trying to disown the damn thing. We have made all of our articles and materials available on our academia.edu websites and in the past 18 months they've been viewed 11,000 times in 112 countries, 1,500 cities and 900 universities. We've been asked to give 27 invited lectures and workshops uh, in eight countries and 16 cities. And we now have a network of six partner universities who are integrating transition design into curricula and research strands, and we're in conversation with several more. All of the materials that we've open sourced and the events that we're holding are based upon the conviction that designers have an important role to play in helping our societies transition toward more sustainable futures. And we think some designers will naturally gravitate towards this kind of work. But the radical contextual thinking it requires will be relevant to practically any area of design. Transition design will be slow but meaningful work focused on what Stuart Brand calls the long now. I may not be around to see the results, but plenty of you in this room could be. So we hope that you will join us in the conversation. Thank you. So let's talk about this. So the, one of our things we have right now when it comes to design is we iterate, we have quick results, we have data, and one of the powers that designers have, new, kind of new powers we have in boardrooms and leadership circles, is that there's a very big evidence base for design thinking and well-designed things to result in more money, for example. Whereas the transition uh, approach um, is not something you can necessarily test right away. In fact, it almost is impossible to test right That's away. Right. So how do you make that transition to being a transition? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the thing to emphasize is that work needs to be happening all along a continuum from the present and the near present and the fiscal, the fiscal quarters that we all have to work to. I'm embedded in one of those institutions too. I have to worry about money every day. But I think what we haven't been good at is undertaking projects that are intentionally long that are aimed towards a long-term future that we have not been very good at articulating. So it's not that this is now the approach, it's an approach to trying to frame projects that we think need to unfold over long horizons of time. So part of the skill, I think, is in framing a problem, iterating it, documenting results, more like software, really. We don't ever expect the next release to be done. We expect it to be better. We expect to find bugs. We expect it to every now and then radically change. And there's something about the need to design with future generations in mind and move more slowly as we do that. I think that's really important. If, if you go to the best acupuncturist you have ever experienced, and I went to a Chinese person once in 
San Francisco that he didn't speak any English. My file said Western woman in Chinese characters. <laughs> and he might put one needle in him. And then he would just kind of look for maybe 20 minutes and go away. And I'd come back. And the next time, he'd put one somewhere else. And it was slow work. And I think that's why I use the metaphor of mm -hmm. acupuncture. I think it's similar to that. Right. So then how are you in the process? So it sounds like you have to kind of course correct rather than iterate. Like you, you're not really finishing and That's releasing. Right. You're just kind of like little moments. Little moments. And, yeah. and well, I think the important thing to mention, there's a lot more to the transition design framework. And we actually have a hundred of these to, to give out if you go see Gideon somewhere at, at the break. Um, but there's a framework that, that places vision as a really important part of this. Mm -hmm. So if small actions in the present are guided and informed by a longer term vision, you're actually sort of back casting from that point. And the emphasis is on lifestyles. Like how can we envision place-based lifestyles in which our quality of life would actually improve? But there's a long way between here and there. So what are some small moves you can make? Yeah. And you're exactly right. It's course correcting along the way. And so, so one of the things that as design has grown in ascendancy is this sort of like ego with design <laughs> has grown with ascendancy. Like we know what's right and there are people who lead companies are design minded. Whereas this approach requires a lot of other expertise in systems thinking that really you have to sublimate your ego to achieve what you want to achieve. Is that, is that we just I, got here, you're going to tell us that we have to step back? <laughs> no, I think that that's a really good point. I think that we all get paid to be certain, don't we? You want your doctor to be fairly certain when you go see them. I can you know, be fairly certain when I teach my students how to letter space. But the bigger the context becomes, the less certain you can be because you're, you're now drawing a frame around very large systems. And when you thought, start thinking radically, contextually, and temporally in long horizons of time, that is when I think we have to let go of our ego because we can't predict how these systems will change. So it's more, I think, about context and, and horizon lines. It's not about giving up our expertise, mm -hmm. but you know, remember when we had that huge oil leak in the Gulf? They just rushed within weeks to solve that problem and they put all of this dispersant in the water to make it look better. But then they found out that the thing that they did, the quick fix they applied, actually ended up damaging more life in the water than the oil had. And that's us. We just rushed to fix things. And when we're dealing when we're dealing with these large, complex systems, that's where I think human hubris comes in. We don't understand them well enough to act quickly. And David Orr always says, ignorance is not solvable. It's part of the human condition. <laughs> so, you know, if I'm letter spacing, okay, I'm pretty certain here. Yeah. But not when it comes to big systems. Right. We have a lacuna. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You guys were, I... Terry Irwin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank um, you. Just there,